My title is A Spectacle Before the Universe. What God really expects of us. I have a very, very fine privilege in Washington of working with a man that is a kindred spirit. We love to talk about this truth without ornamenting it and embellishing it and modernizing it. And he's written a book and he sent me a, an autographed copy and I began to go through it and I got to a section that arrested me. And this sermon grows out of that. In the 22nd chapter of Genesis, Abraham is going through an experience so excruciating, it is difficult to even imagine what he was feeling when he lifted that knife, tightened his grip, set his jaw, and prepared to plunge it into the heart of his beloved son Isaac. At that moment, and not before, the angel of the Lord said, Hold it, Abraham. Now I know that thou fearest God. I'm going to confess something to you. I had thought for so long, I guess I was told this, that that was the Lord himself talking. And I had to really go check. Ellen White says, God sent an angel. You see, there's a little problem there. Hold it, Abraham, now I know. Well, that doesn't sound like God who knows the end from the beginning. This angel learns something about Abraham. Well, why shouldn't he have known the kind of man Abraham was? Because Abraham had lied to Pharaoh about Sarah. Abraham had laughed at God's promise about a son coming to his house through Sarah. Abraham had taken Hagar and produced Ishmael through his lack of faith. So angels had questions. And when God got ready to put Abraham through this, he sent an angel. You go watch him. See if he'll come through. In Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White says, The sacrifice was not alone for his good, nor solely for the benefit of succeeding generations but also for the instruction of heavenly intelligences and other worlds. Satan had accused Abraham before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant and was therefore unworthy of God's blessing. I hope you're getting something here. This great controversy has cosmic implications. We are not just involved down here and the whole universe is running along without us. We are the center of attraction. Let me read on. Heavenly beings were witness to the scene as the faith of Abraham and the submission of Isaac were tested. All heaven, I'm quoting Ellen White, all heaven beheld with wonder and admiration, Abraham's unfaltering obedience. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Up there in glory and out there in the universe, we are being watched. That's why we ought to lift him up every day, all day long. Wherever you are, whoever you think is watching you, lift him up, because nothing is done in private. 
All of our sins are public. Heavenly intelligences are watching. The devil accused one of God's struggling servants. This is the same old line he used that caused Job to cry out, Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. And when Job came through, there was a ripple of applause that went not only in glory, but from world to world to world. I pause to ask us, how do we handle crises? How do we cope? Do we by faith come down on the side of Christ in faith? We're told that the highest evidence of Christianity in a person is self-control. Do you hang together when the chips are down? If you are given to murmuring and complaining, you know, Ellen White says, once Satan almost took her life, all he was trying to get her to do was murmur. Now, if it is that serious, we need to consider what murmuring is. When we murmur and complain, we are joining the devil in accusing God of allowing life to be too hard for us. The whole universe is interested. The devil accused God of being unjust in his law and in his requirements and unfair in the penalties he has set. He said that God was hard and harsh and arbitrary, throwing his weight around. Let's not join the devil in accusing God that way by murmuring. Some people are always unhappy. And if you give them an answer to one problem, they'll find another one. It's their personality problem. They got to complain. Oh, I tell you, the earth is the only place in the universe where there is crime, poverty, racism, disease, injustice, oppression, death, sorrow. These people come on television talking about a spaceship landed and these ugly little people that are green. That's nonsense. Everybody's beautiful, only we have been uglified and pigmentized by sin. God's going to straighten that out too. The psalmist said, I know I shall awake in his likeness, I'll be satisfied. You'll be satisfied one of these days. But the earth right now is the only place where these things are here to test us. The rest of the universe has never experienced the fall. They don't understand weakness. They don't understand struggle. Ellen White says in the 8th volume, page 164, Let us remember we are working in full view of heavenly universe. They're watching us, folks. They are intensely interested in this planet and all that is going on here because the very name of God has been smeared by an angry, cruel, lying devil. Questions have been raised everywhere. And the only place the issue can be, re be resolved is right here. Right here on earth. And they are amazed and shocked by our attitudes and by what we say and how we do and how easily we fall, sometimes up and sometimes down, when there is available help to sustain us all the time. They are amazed that we don't pray. I read that to you yesterday. Let me read it from Scripture. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. We are a spectacle unto men and unto angels. At the cross, Jesus died. And the cross was a mystery to the unfallen world. Desire of Ages 760, heaven viewed with grief and amazement, Christ hanging on the cross, blood flowing from his temples, and sweat tinged with blood standing on his brow. All heaven was filled with wonder when the prayer of Christ was offered in the midst of his suffering. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 20, as Christ is in his expiring agony cried, it is finished. A shout of triumph rang through every world and heaven itself. It sounded like thunder that was heard at the cross. 
Nobody else knew what it was. But Ellen White says when Satan heard that thunder, he knew. Satan knew that in all of his efforts he had not won. A conqueror was hanging on the cross. He had visited those worlds. He knew what triumph sounded like. God's cheering section. Millions of worlds. When the thunder came, he knew. Sin didn't start down here. Started in heaven. Isaiah 14, 12, how art thou fallen from heaven? Sin began somewhere else. Heaven was traumatized, and the other worlds also. And they are watching for an outcome to this problem that has gone on for all these millennia. The sin problem will be resolved. Here, Satan is circumscribed. He continues to question God and create doubts and fears in the experience of Job. He went running up to represent the earth. And when God said, Job is the real representative, Satan said, does he serve you for naught? You pay him well. Job lives by a theology of prosperity. That's what a lot of us want. We got one eye on the rim of the church and another eye on Reb Mike. We wonder why we can't win the lottery. Lord, if you just let me win, I'll build you a church school. We don't understand God, do we? He said to God, you are taking care of Job. You therefore are an extortioner. You're buying his loyalty. You're unjust. You accept and give bribes. There it is. Moses died and Jesus came for his body. The devil went running up on that mountain and planted his filthy feet on the chest of Moses and said, you can't have him. But in the book of Jude, the Bible said, Jesus simply spoke to the devil and said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Moses did do wrong, but Moses is covered with my righteousness. Now I rebuke you. And then when Joshua, the high priest, was standing before the Lord, the Bible says the devil stood by to resist him, and the devil was acute. You ought to read it in the spirit of prophecy. When I read it, tears rolled down my face. Everything the devil was saying about this man, Joshua, was true. The devil doesn't even try to lie to God. And he was pointing out all of Joshua's weaknesses, like we preachers have weaknesses, and you laymen have weaknesses. He was telling God all of his failures, until he heard Jesus say, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Well, how can you take Moses when he died in sin and the wages of sin is death? He belongs to me. Jesus said, I'll die for him. But you haven't died yet. Then put him on my bill. I'll pay later. Ellen White says the plan of redemption, listen, the plan of redemption has broader and deeper purposes than the salvation of men. Now, you know, we never, we so, we're so narrow in our view. And surely he died for me, and praise God he did. But Ellen White says the plan of, uh, 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 the plan of redemption has a much deeper and broader purpose than the salvation of men. Not for this alone, Christ came to the earth to vindicate the character of God before the entire universe. What he did at the cross wasn't just for us. Thank God he did it for us. But it was done for those unfallen worlds and all of those beings out there. And so when Jesus came down here, he called a spade a spade. And candidly, he looked the devil in the eye and called him a liar. You're a liar and the father of it. You said that my father gave us a law that is too hard. Well, I'm telling you that for what the law could not do, in that it was weak in the flesh, God sent me in the flesh. I didn't come down here wearing divinity. I came down here like everybody else to overcome sin in the flesh. That people who live in the flesh might also overcome who are willing to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. 
And I have kept my father's commandments. You're a liar. John 15, 10. Jesus said one day, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. One writer said, he cometh and hath nothing on me. If the devil could have accused him, he would have. Even the devil had to admit that he was sinless and the unblemished lamb of God without spot. And the second thing, you said that God is not a God of love, you liar. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so cared that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And the whole universe was looking on and burst into applause. Let me repeat something I said. When we go out from the presence of our brothers and sisters and pastors and officers and do stupid things, when we run into these movies, look both ways and duck in, you're not getting away with anything. It's all public. Lift him up or get out of the way. Unfallen worlds are looking on. It is the nature of man to be inhibited by moral presence. This is purely an illustration, but let's assume that my friend Pastor Washington loved to uh, drink. Illustration now. <laughs> And let's say that every now and then he'd sneak into a package store and buy a bottle. Do you know if I were walking with him, he'd never do that? I wouldn't even know he wanted to do it, but he would never do it in my presence. My presence would inhibit him. That's why people who sin like to sneak around. That's why they like darkness too. Most of it goes on at night. Now, God is watching, and Ellen White says, nothing will have a more positive effect on character development than a constant awareness of God's abiding presence. If you just believed him when he said, I'm with you, then there's some things you wouldn't do, because he's with you. But to make it even worse, the whole universe is watching you. You're a spectacle, and a sorry spectacle at that, when you go do these things deliberately. You are saying, maybe Satan has a point. There's some things you don't do when others are looking. The Spirit of Prophecy says, when Christ died, the death knell of Satan was rung. He was then consigned to hell. He knows that the jig is up. He knows the prophecies. The Bible says, I will destroy thee, O covering cherub. You shall be brought to ashes. Ezekiel 28. The Bible says, you'll be destroyed, root and branch. Malachi 4.1. The Bible says in Nahum 1, that he will bring an utter end. The devil knows what's coming. And while tempting lost men to procrastinate, the Bible says, he knows that he has but a short time. He wants you to think you can get it right next year. Or next week. Somebody here won't be at camp meeting next year. But the devil makes you think you're going to live forever. And he knows that he has but a short time. Therefore, he is furious. He is angry. He is without pity. He goes about deceiving. He acts like a friend, but he is no friend. Now look at this. He was kicked out of heaven the father's house, but he still had access to other worlds. That's why he went running around up there in the days of Job. But on the cross, the whole universe was watching, beaten, scourged, mocked, spat upon Jesus. The worlds up there were watching. The one who created the universe submitted to torture. The one they had praised in celestial glory was now clothed in human flesh and was brought to the very dregs of human existence by his own hateful, ungrateful creatures, the ones whom he had made. And to them, this was the greatest manifestation of selfless love in the history of eternity. And they made a decision. 
unfallen principalities saw, and they judged, and they said in effect concerning Satan, throw the bomb out. We don't want him up here anymore. That's why Revelation 12 says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. When he was kicked out of heaven, he couldn't bother God anymore. When he killed Jesus, he can't bother the heavens anymore. So he's doing his whole thing down here. I got some good news. One day he won't be able to bother us anymore. Would you say amen out there? No more access to the universe. Our dark planet, therefore, is crawling with demons. These superhuman creatures that joined the devil in his rebellion are everywhere. Their specialty is deception and misery. They despise us, and especially those who claim to be members of the remnant church. They work on us all the time. I don't blame them. If I were the devil, that's what I'd do. Because when they can get you to mess up, they rub it in Jesus' face. They despise you. Ellen White says they don't even like each other. Desire of Ages 761, Satan saw that his design was torn away. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he has uprooted himself from the sympathies of heavenly beings. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly worlds was broken at the cross. But still he wasn't destroyed. The angels didn't understand. Why don't you go ahead and get rid of him? The other worlds don't understand. Because they don't understand all that is involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed, says Desire of Ages. And now I come to this text that turned me on. Ephesians 3 and verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. The manifold wisdom of God. Somebody ought to say amen. Amen. As weak as we are, we are God's exhibit. You see, they never had to struggle against sin. They never had any weaknesses. So they don't understand. Therefore, the Bible says, listen, to the intent that the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church. The manifold wisdom of God. Verse 11 says, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. From eternity, Christ was given to the cross to save us. At that same time, God determined that the church being saved would become his exhibit of what love is and what justice is to unfallen worlds. Let me read it in the New International Version. Through the church, are you listening? Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is to be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Would you say amen? Amen. A spectacle unto the universe. Lift him up, church. You know, you've chosen two great themes these last two years. I couldn't be here last year because of surgery. I wanted to be here on that one. But this one is equally as noble. Lift him up. Lift him up to be a member of this church and keep on fumbling and falling. It's not only a disgrace. It is not only as dangerous. It is utterly stupid. God decided that in addition to the cross, he would use his people to make known uh, to unfallen worlds and to honor him before the universe. That's why he called Israel for his own glory. Isaiah 49, 3. God wants to use us to resolve all questions concerning his character throughout the whole universe. Lift him up. Acts of Apostles, page 9. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. And eventually he will make manifest 
even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the final and full display of the love of God. No wonder he cares so much about us. She also says that his church on earth, earth is the only thing on which he bestows his supreme regard. Now, if the church is special, I've come to tell you tonight we're nearing the end. And the hundred and forty and four thousand will be so special that they're going to form and honor God and tour the universe with the King of Kings. When the Chicago Bulls won the basketball championship, the next day they put them in a parade. And they let people gather by the hundreds of thousands so they could get a close-up look at Michael Jordan. And the rest of those, you see, they showed them off in Chicago. Well, God is going to use this 140 and 4,000 who have lifted him up. He's going to take them throughout the universe. Why? Because they are his heroes. I want to be a hero. Heroes hang tough. Heroes don't give up every time the wind blows cold. Heroes stand for something. God says, I'm going to take them to unfallen worlds who do not know the weakness of the flesh, and they will be amazed. You mean drunkards and liars and prostitutes are now glorified with you as perfect as you are? Here they are. Look at them. The IT is wonderful, isn't it? There will be martyrs up there. He's going to put red bands around the bottom of their robes. Spectacle. He wouldn't put it on there if it wasn't for a purpose. He wants people to see it. This is their uniform. He wants people to know in unfallen worlds, these face death. Devil said that my way was too hard, but these people died rather than yield. These people gave up their lives. I want you to see what love can do. I love them. They love me. And then justice. Satan questioned justice. My son died to pay the debt. Church, through you, I want to manifest my wisdom and show the whole universe what it's all about. During Desert Storm, I saw a spectacular thing in a documentary. These modern tanks were out there with all these modern weapons. And then they showed a little slip of a girl, a soldier, a United States soldier. She was 37 miles from the front. And she had these computers and screens in front of her. And these men are almost driving blind, 37 miles away. A little girl is telling them, turn right, turn left, fire now. And they were winning every battle. What a marvelous thing our technology is. The nerve center was 37 miles away. Well, I got news for you. We're in war down here, but the nerve center is way up in glory, and you've got to have communications. You've got to be able to talk up there and hear them talk down here. And when they say turn right, you better turn right. If they say turn left, turn left. Special people. Special means uncommon. I... I have a habit of doing this. I, I look up words I already know. Yes. See if I can get a little nuance, a little shade. Yes. This word special means uncommon. Yes. Common, ordinary people can't be a part of this group without being transformed. <laughs> Must say amen. Yes. Special people, it means distinctive, extraordinary, peculiar. But it's also a tender word, word that you whisper into your wife's ear. She's special. I remember Alex Haley's roots, you know. And there was the resounding theme to brighten the helplessness and hopelessness of slavery. Kunta Kinte would say to his children and his family, always remember, you're special people. Mandingo from the river Belonga. Special. Chicken George took it up and told his sons, 
that his sons told their sons. And Alex Haley had a feeling that he was special. Special. To be a part of the remnant church is special. You've got to believe it down deep in your heart until it affects your actions. It affects your walk. It affects your talk. It affects how you dress. The Lord called me. You heard Ella Cleveland talk about it. Called me to the ministry and you're talking about poor. Everybody was poor. Went off to study at Oakwood. My father had a little talk with me. He wasn't educated. My father told me, son, I reckon I had about a third grade education. Mother was as far as it went in those days, in the 1800s. But my dad wasn't allowed to go to school. He had a wicked, drunkard stepfather. I've often thought of how much wisdom he had and what would have happened if he had been educated, Phil. But when he, I got ready to go, he wanted to talk to me. He said, son, I don't have any money, but I am bequeathing my name. Don't ever forget you're a Brooks. Now, now that didn't indicate money, as I've already said. Being a Brooks didn't mean that I had athletic prowess. Being a Brooks didn't mean that I would be good looking. Being a Brooks didn't mean that I would be intellectually brilliant. But what it did mean was there was some honor associated with that name. My daddy was known as an honest person with character. And therefore he said, when you go, wherever you go, I've never been from home before. He said, wherever you go, remember you're a Brooks. There's some things you can't do because you are a Brooks. And I never forgot that. In my youth, I went up to the edge many a time, and I remembered that and drew back. Thank God. You remember this remnant church? There are things you can't do. Can't follow every fad and fashion that comes down the line. You can't do every stupid thing everybody else is doing. You're special. Special people who hear above the din and confusion of these last lost People are discontented far from beyond the skies, and you're marching to a different beat. When I was young, rich families sent their daughters to finishing school. You ever hear of that? And they used to show them in the movies when I was a boy, and they'd walk around with books on their heads so they'd learn posture and carriage. Well, we're special, and we're in God's finishing school, and you better get this book in your, in your head, not on your head. I don't mind telling you, I get a little impatient. Please forgive me, Lord and people. I get a little impatient when people who have been taught God's Word get a pamphlet in the mail and then come questioning the position of the church that is founded on the authority of the Bible. And then you want me to discuss it. You're wasting my time. Throw that junk in the trash. The Word of God is true. Let everybody else be a liar. We're in finishing school, and the time is short. And everybody here ought to now, everybody here ought to now aspire to be in the 140 and 4,000. Now, maybe you won't be. That's up to God. But you ought to grow in that direction. That is the only practical thing to do if time is as short as we say it is. The Holy Spirit will bring into such of us complete harmony with God so that we'll be sealed. And when you're sealed, you go out no more. You can't be lost. God wants to do that for us. And then when God has sealed them, Jesus is going to walk out from between God and man. He's going to take off the, the, the mediatorial garments of a priest and put on the regal garments of a king. And he's going to say to Satan, all right, there's my crowd. Try them. Test them. And we're going to have to live in the sight of the devil and God without an intercessor. We're going to have to have something to stand on. You better get it together now. Yes. Yes. Right. 140 and 4,000 will not be sealed in a time of ease. But they're going to be sealed in a time when the savage winds are straining to be let loose. A time of danger. A time near the end. John said, I heard the number of them that were sealed. 
144,000. Now, that's definite language. I've, I've been on both sides. I've tried to go along with all the philosophy, but I don't find anything to indicate this is symbolic. And when I said something to Elder Mosley about it, he said, Brooks, I wasn't the way he's going to find that many. But we're not without hope. There are two groups mentioned here. One is numerable and the other is innumerable. The numerable group is 144,000. The rest of them is a number that no man could number. So I'm talking about the 140 and 4,000. Ellen White says they are the most exalted of the redeemed hosts, for they have come through great tribulation. When you read about their tribulation in the revised version, it says great distress. The Moffat's version says great affliction and persecution. When you want to be saved easy, I know I should say easily, but I, I want to say it the way I feel. When you want to be saved easy, because cause, cause I'm, I'm coming home now. Have you ever seen such crybabies amongst us? Can't take a thing for Jesus. And nobody's laid a hand on them yet. Nobody's put them in jail. Nobody's thrown a sword or a gun. But they can't even stand ridicule. They can't stand people to criticize them. Ellen White says, when we come into harmony with God's will, we will appear to others as odd, singular, and fanatical. Might as well make up our minds. Everybody's not going to like you. The closer you get to God, the more the devil is going to turn on you. Want to be saved easy? Then we're driving our points down on the devil's side. You don't want to be different, don't want to be criticized. And we're going to have them easy. How are you going to, how are you going to stare Daniel in the face who went into a lion's den? What you going to say when you see the three Hebrew boys up there who went in a fiery furnace? What are you going to say to James who lost his head to Herod's sword? Or to Peter who was crucified upside down? Or Paul whose head was chopped off by Nero? Or to the 50 millions that died at the hands of the medieval church during the Dark Ages? What are you going to say to them when you can't even stand a little criticism? Ellen White says the refining fire is coming. The time of trouble. And listen to this. She said it will be worse in reality than in anticipation. Now that's the other way around for us. We usually worry about things and they're not half as bad as we think they're going to be. But the time of trouble is going to be worse than we can imagine. But this is God's refining process. This is his culling process. I grew up on a farm, and we used to pile potatoes like a mountain. And then we'd sit down with baskets and pick out all the ones that the plow had cut or bruised. They call that culling your potatoes. And the perfect ones went on to market or, or were stored away. And those that were culled were given away. They were still good, but they were rejected. God's going to cull His church and pull out all of those, shake out all of those who can't stand anything. Who oh, easily bruised, who haven't developed a soft, a hard shell. <laughs> Go take them out. This will be his process for culling his church. The great controversy then is going on. The shaking time is approaching, and the whole universe is now watching with bated breath. The victory was won at the cross, but the battle is still being fought. You have to fight it every day. Now, you already got the victory, but you got to play your part and fight for it. Come on, say amen out there. You're still fighting. And every victory gained helps settle the issue in the world out there. You're special people. Now, if you're a special people, you're a special target. Revelation 12, 17, dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with a remnant of her seed. He picked out a certain group. Who are they? Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So ladies and gentlemen, we might as well understand that. Here, above all, Satan hopes to humiliate Christ. He can't get up to heaven to spread his dirt there. He can't go to unfallen worlds to spread his filth amongst the stars. 
Whatever he's going to do to make Jesus feel bad, he got to do it here. And when he can get us to fall, Jesus is crucified afresh. His face is bathed with death. He reacts to us. How do I know? Because the Bible says when one of us does right, there's joy in heaven. So he'll use the church to show the whole universe. He wants to show us all. My son has the cutest little baby girl. You know, all grandfathers think. Oh, but she's a doll. And she's as frisky as she can be. And her mother and her aunt have taught her a little litany of answers to questions. How old are you? When were you born? And all these things, you know. What, what's your grandmother's name? What's your grand... She knows all of it. So the other day they brought her over and they're going through it. And I was amazed. Amazed. This is my granddaughter. I was amazed. So I grabbed out my VCR. And it takes a time to set that thing up with all the lights and all that stuff. As soon as I got her on camera, she wouldn't say a word. <laughs> they pleaded and they cajoled. And she just would run off and jump in a rocking chair and do something else. When company comes, you want to show them off. You know, and you start asking all these questions. Want to say a word. Give the wrong answer. What is this? This is my elbow. <laughs> then when the company leaves, perfect. Lord is trying to show us all. He wants somebody he can count on. He wants somebody who will come through. Ephesians 2.10 says, His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Therefore, Matthew says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Christ can take the worst sinner and change him. But once we come into the church... We often feel him while the universe is looking on. We're careful that other men don't see us, but the whole universe is looking on. I had a thought jump into my head just then. We've got people going around now propagating a kind of degenerative filth that is beneath any decent person, whether he's a Christian or not, and they're saying it's all right. But Ellen White says angels are in your bedroom. I don't need to be explicit, do I? Have mercy. We fail him and the universe is watching. We become a public embarrassment. God sees, angels see, and unfallen worlds see. That's why it's so important for us to get our heads together. We're not legalists. Some of us pride ourselves in keeping the commandments. That's only a part of it. You want me to prove it? The Bible says we know that whatever we ask of Him we receive because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. You must not only obey His commands, you must please Him. There is no commandment that says, Thou shalt not wear earrings, but if it pleases Him and you love Him, take them off. we got to please Him. No need arguing and debating with a church about what you got on. If you had on the right thing, you wouldn't have to argue. St. Paul said, I die daily. It's a battle every day. But as long as we are daily dying in Christ Jesus, then the universe applauds. The universe is looking on. The great struggle will soon be over. A hallelujah time is just ahead. There's going to be some music. You ought to read about it. You know, I have sat on platforms and heard music that made my hair stand up wherever it could. I have felt something running up and down my spine listening to music. We're going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. And this last great celebration will be in response to the going down of Satan's kingdom. 
Babylon reaches doom and the saints reach the sea of glass. I thrill every time I think about it. My mother going to be there. My daddy will be there. Yours. Your loved ones will be there. Old saints that went to sleep long time ago are going to be there. Today, God's judgments seem a little hard and we tremble. But we don't have a proper concept of the awful character of sin. But when that lake of fire sizzles and roars, everybody who is still alive is going to raise his voice and sing, Just and true are thy ways. Righteous are thy judgments. The 24 elders will cry, Amen. Amen. The reign of sin is over. All glory to God and to Christ. And a great hallelujah chorus is going to swell to a climax. And it will roll through the universe. Ellen White indicates that all of the people in all of the world won't be there, but representatives are going to be there. And the sound of hallelujah will roll through the universe with the majesty of the sound of many waters and many thunderings. I will confess something. I had never heard Handel's Messiah till I got to Oakwood College. Came up in a small town, never heard it. Oh, there were people there who had, but I'd never heard it. And I remember hearing them practice while I went to the dairy at 3 o'clock in the morning. And finally the night came, and everybody was excited. And I confess I'd never heard anything like it. Man, I sat there, and, and I felt hot and cold flashes. And then we came to the Hallelujah Chorus. And the audience stood. I didn't even know you were supposed to, but I had no trouble doing that. It brought me out of my seat. And they sang that sublime music. And finally, they came to a brief pause, a stillness. And the bass singers began to sing, For he shall reign forever and ever. The altos grabbed it in a higher key and began to repeat it. The tenors lifted it to the sky and sang it again. And then the sopranos came in, King of kings and Lord of lords. And as if someone asked, how long shall he reign? They sang forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The prayer is fulfilled. Thy kingdom come. Ellen White says the family on earth is united with the family in heaven. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah, home at last. See the lame come running. Hear the dumb sing a song of praise. The blind, the outside seeing, and the old folks stand in place. The warfare's concluded. I lay down my sword and shield and study war no more. The bridegroom accepts his bride. A rival had sought her affection and won many away, but the true bride remained faithful, and she's there with the true bridegroom. In order to make it to the sea of glass, she had to go through great trials and tribulation. But he had won her whole heart, and she would not be shaken out. And like any bridegroom, with deep pride, he presented her to the Father. And the Father loves her. I have a daughter-in-law. We never use that term, in-law. She's my daughter. 
A grand festival then takes place. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says it takes place because the bride has made herself ready. Would you say amen out there? Now, I deal with a lot of weddings, and you probably do too, and you know it's up to the bride to set the date. We want to win as Jesus coming. It's up to the bride. When you get ready, you will come. And the Bible says the bride has made herself ready. She got on the right color. White raiment. Not one thread of human devising is in her garment. Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The bride is a city also. It's called Zion through the ages. Somebody came to me wanting to debate that the church was the bride. Well, if I read explicitly that it is, it is. And if I read that the city is, it is. So then I went to the spirit of prophecy, and we were told that the city is called the bride because it embraces the bride. The city is called the bride because it's full of the bride. Come on, say amen out there. And they all dressed in finest linen. In Israel, there were three kinds of linen. You had ordinary linen worn by the priests. You had fine linen that composed the curtains of the sanctuary. But the high priest wore the finest linen, glistening white. Kings also wore that kind of linen. When the ark came back to Jerusalem, David had on fine linen. And there's going to be a banquet. How thoughtful of Jesus. Do you know how many times you left out of everything down here? First thing he's going to do is have a banquet. I went, I went to a dinner in South America amongst millionaires. I had never seen so much silver on each side of the plate in my life. I didn't know what to do with it. But I knew how to follow my host. And I was charming. I was just talking and smiling. And he'd pick up a certain little old thing, I'd pick it up. When we get to heaven, the host is going to serve us. A table many miles in length. He said, I'm going to gird myself. And I'm going to serve you. Catch the vision. The Bible begins and ends with the vision of paradise. There's no sad ending. When I go to funerals, I remember that's chapter 1. Chapter 2, it's going to turn out all right. And now the Spirit and the Bride say, Come! Let him that is a thirst come! Whosoever will, let him come! For behold, I come quickly! Quickly! Too quickly for many! While the scoffers say he delays his coming, a man said to me, Pastor, if he doesn't come for another thousand years, I'm not going to be here. As far as I'm concerned, it's quickly! we got precious little time to get it all together. A friend of mine had a heart attack on the steps of the church. We took him into the secretary's office. The nurses came in. Everybody was trying to help him while the ambulance was coming. He looked up through a smile, stricken. And he said, Chief, pays to be ready. He hadn't planned to die that day. We'd planned to go on vacation together. We'd spent about an hour at my home talking about where we were going and what we were going to do. He hadn't planned to die that day. He hadn't planned to die that day. But in his last moments, he said, It pays. It pays to be ready. A whole world is consigned to fire. But unfallen worlds are rooting for us. Jesus wants us home. Stop this fooling around, playing footsie with the devil. If you're going to be a part of this thing, be it. 24 hours a day, be it. All sneaking around is being watched by a whole universe. My Father, Lord, have mercy on me. You've already told us that duplicity is fatal. 
I want to be real. I am weak, but thou art strong. Have mercy on me. What I have told you is the truth. It's real. Christ is coming soon. Anybody out there want to say tonight, Lord, I want to stand this evening and give my heart to you. Is there a backslider who wants to say, Lord, I want to come back home now. I want to be in the fold again. I want all these dreadful sins that worry me and frighten me taken away. I want to meet you in the kingdom, and by the grace of God, we may be there. I'm particularly concerned about backsliders. You don't have to leave the church to be a backslider. And, and I know we got problems. Because we don't love each other as we ought. All this fussing and this confusion and the, writing these unsigned letters. Y'all know what that means? Worlds are astonished. i tell you the truth. If I were not in this thing, I'd jump right up. Jesus will take you when nobody else wants to fool with you. Jesus will. He'll save you, too. No need talking about how unworthy you are. We're all unworthy. We're saved by grace. By His worthiness. Now I appeal to you, whom I must leave. Don't you want to be amongst God's special people? You can leave the future with Him, but you want to prepare. You want to be different when you leave this campground. I do. And I know what the struggle is. You feel that way? Stand with me. And now, bow your heads. Close your eyes. Shut out all human traffic. And start talking to the Lord in your heart. And just tell Him how you feel right now. If you've been doing wrong, tell Him. He knows already. The whole universe knows. Just tell Him now. And ask Him to give you a new start. A new heart. New determination. Pray now. Pray now. Pray for one another. Mothers, pray for your children. Wives, pray for your husbands. Husbands, pray for your wives. Pray for your families. Pray for your churches that are ripped with discord. Pray that the Holy Spirit will bring us together and keep us together. Pray for your leaders. Do it right now. Put them on the altar. And then climb up on that altar yourself and expose yourself to the mercy of God now. What a privilege it is to carry everything, everything to God in prayer. Oh, my Father, we do come in the name of Jesus. We acknowledge our mistakes and our sins. We do the only thing we can do with them. We bring them to Thee. Clothed in our filthy garments, we stand before Thee and ask for cleansing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Turn us not away. Remove the discouragement from our minds. All the lies the devil has whispered to us, banish them now. We stand naked before Thee. Nothing in our hands we bring, simply to the cross we cling. Lord, please, look at us. Look at us, Lord, standing before you.
we represent many different needs and problems and habits. Please suit a blessing to every one of us. Now, we are not going to multiply words. We want to end this service with an appeal to thee in the name of Jesus to make us what we ought to be. Break us. Melt us. Mold us. And fill us. May we never be the same again. We ask in the strong name of Jesus and for his sake. Let everyone say amen.